It's time to shed light on our universe. This is All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light. Join us as we explore the latest in lasers, optics, spectroscopy, and microscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape. We're brought to you by Photonics Media. This is Associate Editor Joel Williams. Here are this week's top stories. A novel optical element will one day enable composite lenses and telescopes in a form factor small enough to fit in a pocket. The device, developed by Orad Reshef and Jeff Landine of the University of Ottawa, is called a spaceplate. Its function, say its developers, is to mimic the empty space needed to focus an image meaning that one day, photographers will be able to take pictures of faraway subjects without carrying around a long-barrel telephoto lens. A quantum microscope developed at the University of Queensland can resolve cellular structures that would otherwise be impossible to see. The technology overcomes the barrier of photo damage induced by high-powered lasers used in fluorescence microscopy by employing quantum-correlated light. Researchers from Kyushu University and North Carolina State University have demonstrated the ability to switch the surface of liquid metal between reflective and scattering states. The method uses an electrically driven reversible chemical reaction to create a reflective surface on the metal. The technology could one day be used to create electrically controllable mirrors or illumination devices. Researchers at the University of Waterloo report the first successful transfer and recovery of quantum coherence using photons scattered in free space. The work points toward research opportunities and applications in fields ranging from quantum communication to imaging and beyond. And finally, a new approach to synthesizing perovskite quantum dots has significantly increased their use value, according to members from an international research collaboration. The method, developed by researchers at National Tsinghua University in Taiwan and Northwestern University in Illinois, creates stable, extremely bright, self-healing quantum dots through a refined process called spray synthesis. Up next, we conclude Season 3 of All Things Photonics with a conversation with John Harvey, founder and CEO of Southern Photonics, followed by a segment on solid tissue imaging microscopy with Rohit Baharkov. I'm Joel Williams, and you're listening to All Things Photonics. Today's episode is sponsored by Perkin Elmer, a leader in applied chemical and advanced material testing markets. Perkin Elmer provides laboratory instruments, services, software, and consumables worldwide with the knowledge and expertise to help customers gain earlier and more accurate insights and analyses. For more information, visit PerkinElmer.com. We conclude season three of All Things Photonics with a special guest, that being Dr. John Harvey. Dr. Harvey is founder of the University of Auckland Laser Lab and of executive positions with Southern Photonics, of which he is founder, and OSA's International Photonics Advocacy Coalition. From his start in nuclear physics to a successful career in and throughout the laser industry, Dr. Harvey is uniquely qualified to speak about numerous core optics and photonics technologies and about the growth and development of photonics in New Zealand and Australia. He joins us from New Zealand today. Hello to Dr. John Harvey. Hello, Jay. Nice to see you. Nice to speak with you as well. I uh, mentioned it in the intro. You did your PhD work in theoretical nuclear physics, um, but ultimately you moved into biophotonics, and probably before biophotonics was even a word, to work with molecular-weighted virus particles. Now, that to me, and maybe to our listeners, is a fascinating progression, but it's not a linear one. Uh, why did you move away from nuclear physics, and, and what drew you first to biophotonics and ultimately to photonics? Well, it's... Um it's certainly interesting to look back on it because it's uh, it's a long while ago now. But at the time when I did my PhD, which was in the 1970s, then uh, nuclear physics was the thing to do if you were interested in physics. However, 
I didn't find it that interesting, despite the fact that that was where I was sort of being steered. So after my PhD, I was not interested in doing any more theoretical nuclear physics and was casting around for something to do, as one does when you're at that stage of your life. And I'd had a, a very uh, interesting lecture, which i would attended as a graduate student before I had done my PhD, from a professor in the uh, biological sciences uh, region who told all the physicists about the um, structure of nucleic acids, uh, the triplet code, and the way biology now was all going to be dominated by molecular biology, whereas in the past it had been basically, well, we used to refer to it disparagingly as stamp collecting, um, botany and uh, zoology and so on. And it was such a fascinating story that I scarcely believed it. This was, this was only about 10 years after the structure of DNA was elucidated. And it stayed with me, and because at the end of the lecture he had said, the problem we have in biology is that nobody understands mathematics, that we're all enumerate. He said, so if anybody in physics ever wants to come and work in biology, get in touch with me and I'll organize it. So I got him back in touch with him. He was a very famous person who'd written a textbook on virology, which was used around the world. He immediately came back and said, I'll organize a postdoctoral fellowship, which he did. So I moved back to New Zealand to take up a postdoctoral fellowship in, in the biological sciences department. And his instructions to me were, I don't care what you do, just talk to people here, try and make yourself useful, but you have to get your hands dirty. In order to get my hands dirty, I started growing bacteria and various things like that. But talk to people who were virologists, and it rapidly uh, became apparent that one of the ways in which you might be able to use your training as a physicist was to take advantage of a recently developed technique which measured the diffusion coefficient of large molecules using laser. And uh, that used Rayleigh scattering. Uh, and you looked at the autocorrelation function of the scattered light. And so we applied for a, um, we made a grant application to apply for funds for a laser. And it was just the time when everybody was interested in what's called interdisciplinary science now. And this was funded, much to the surprise of people in the physics department and in the biology department. So that was really the genesis of that work. And it went on for about a decade, during which time I started doing other biophysical uh, measurements. In fact, as you, as you mentioned there, the modern word biophotonics uh, hadn't been invented then. In fact, even photonics wasn't being used. So over the course of this interview, you know, I suspect that one of the themes that will emerge will be the relationship you yourself balance between research, academia, and industry. Uh, and we'll touch on it. Before we go in depth there and look at things through your lens, how has that relationship between research and industry changed from the 70s and 80s and 90s to the present? Well, I can really only speak from the perspective of New Zealand and to a lesser extent Australia, where I have um, lots of colleagues working in a similar field. But... In the 70s, 80s, nobody in the university really gave any thought to commercializing their research. The funding was to do research, and particularly in New Zealand and Australia, because we're such a long way away from the epicenters, the aim was to do research which really put the department and the university on the world stage. So, so it's getting publications in the top journals was the main thing. And there was, I can think of only one group in the physics department from that period, 60s, 70s, 80s, which commercialized some research. They did it very successfully, uh, but they were regarded as almost as eccentrics, not, not as in any way mainstream. What happened, however, in, uh, in my career was that I moved from biophotonics gradually, um, since I was by now employed in the physics department, through to using lasers for all sorts of other things, particularly for communications research. And so I was often going to the communications conferences in the US uh, and Europe, to ECOC, to OFC, etc. And of course, associated with these conferences where you presented your research were the, the trade shows. And the trade shows were just eye-opening, uh, particularly in, as, as the 90s went on and we moved towards the, the ridiculous dot-com boom and bust in sort of instant billionaires sort of situation. This was something which you could go back to New Zealand and talk about, and people just 
could scarcely comprehend the scale of what was happening. And I was in the situation where I was bridging both worlds. So I was very keen to bring some of this excitement back to New Zealand, particularly since a lot of our graduate students that we were training at great expense were ending up going and working for companies in other countries. It would be really great if they could work here in New Zealand. So that became a mission about the uh, turn of the century. Unfortunately, this was the time when everything went bust. Right? So I formed Southern Photonics in 2001. Uh, I can still remember somebody saying to me sort of mournfully as the trade shows emptied and companies collapsed. And if you can survive by forming a company in the downtime, then you'll be well positioned to survive longer term. And indeed, Southern Photonics is still here. Uh, and it's much easier now because uh, the universities actively promote uh, the formation of startup companies. We have entrepreneurial classes in the university. We have competitions with prizes for students to come up with ideas that can be commercialized, etc. All that was unthinkable back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that you can um, characterize for our listeners the optics and photonics and even the imaging industry in Australia and New Zealand, because geographically, it's a fascinating dynamic um, and one that we're not overly familiar with here. Um, you're, you're close to Japan, Korea, China, um, some of the Asian powerhouse nations, um, and then also Europe. So that's, that's a little bit different. Can you shed light, I suppose, my question, can you shed light on the significance of travel um, as a result of the nature of the optics and photonics landscape and its evolution? Well, certainly we have to travel a lot. If you live in Australia and New Zealand, the marketplace for your products, with a few exceptions, are all in the Northern Hemisphere. And the nearest place where you might go to a trade show or you might go to try and sell your products is a 12-hour flight away. That's a long haul. So the net effect of this is that, particularly these days, one starts to uh, worry about the so-called carbon footprint that this generates, not since COVID, of course, but I certainly clocked up the best part of 3 million miles, according to my frequent <laughs> flight plan over those decades. The fact of the matter is you can't get to a conference in Europe without two 12-hour flights each way. So that makes it fairly tough. Looking back on it, however, it's not the flying that's the problem. It's the jet lag. It is really hard to function. The worst of the lot, to be honest, is, is where you are. I used to go to meetings on the East Coast and the working day, which was 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., is midnight to 8 a.m. Right. Right. I should have said the intro that uh, Dr. John Harvey joins us from 14 and a half hours in the future. Uh, I didn't think of it in time. But yes, I can imagine that that would be a challenge. And you brought up the pandemic. And given the relationship that travel has to the growth, development, refinement of the optics, photonics, imaging industries in Australia and New Zealand, how has the pandemic affected the development in your area of the world? Well, it's had the same effect, I think, probably as it has had around the world in that people have had to, to pivot to a much greater reliance on the sort of um, meetings that, uh, that, we, that you, Jake, and I are having at the moment, which is um, via video link. And that has, for me, uh, been a huge advantage in that it solves the jet lag problem. But there's no doubt in my mind that it doesn't completely replace the person-to-person -person meetings. And Everybody that I know in Australia and New Zealand is still uh, looking forward to being able to go and sit down with their customers or their colleagues or their research associates in person, even if it's only uh, once or twice a year. Nevertheless, it has shown us that the world can carry on. Although, certainly from the point of view of Southern Photonics, it's meant that we have pivoted from the products that we were previously reliant upon to developing new products which uh, might have a more substantial market locally. Um, this is one of the issues with setting up a photonics company in Australia or New Zealand. The bulk of your sales are going to be in the Northern Hemisphere normally because you're trying to develop uh, something with a, a big market. The big markets are in the Northern Hemisphere. There are markets locally and it's caused us to look more carefully at that. One of the things I think that New Zealand and Australia can take advantage of is that they have economies which are quite different from economies in Asia in Austria, and in America and in Europe. In New Zealand's case, for example, we are reliant, in fact, I would say over-reliant on primary produce. 
New Zealand's biggest export is milk for baby food in China. In Australia, the biggest export is the mining industry from the mining industry, whereas what we would like in Australia and New Zealand, and this has been part of the, um, the survey that we've been doing recently, what we would like is to move the economies to an economy more reliant on manufacturing of high-tech products, in particular, of course, in my case, photonic-based products, because they have far less environmental impact. Dr. John Harvey is our guest. Uh, tell us about Southern Photonics. Tell us about its formation, the backstory, um, and the growth of the company. The initial aim was to set up a company uh, in the photonics sector because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I've been inspired by what I was seeing at the trade shows in the late 1990s. And in fact, I had a mentor, uh, Simon Poole, which many people, who many people have known, uh, who was in Australia. He was, he'd been a friend of mine for years and he just said, look, John, it doesn't really matter what you do, uh, set up a company and do something. You'll find it's fascinating. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, um, I recall once going to a, going to a meeting and uh, he said, oh, John, how, how's it going? And I said, oh, I'm getting fed up with the university, Simon. And he, he uh, put his arm around my shoulder and said, step this way, John. <laughs> and and that, was, that was the start of Southern Photonics. Uh, we uh, looked around for things we commercialized from my research. And the obvious thing was, since we were in optical communications research, was test and measurement instrumentation for the telecommunications sector. In those days, all uh, optical communications was done with pulses, and the aim to improve bandwidth was to make the pulses shorter and increase the repetition rates. However, when you got to 10 gigabits per second and people were looking at moving to 40 gigabits per second, it becomes extremely difficult because the pulses become so short that traditional technology cannot characterize them. So we had developed a, a system a uh, benchtop system which could characterize short pulses, say 10 picosecond pulses, and uh, that was what we commercialized. That started the Southern Photonics as a company, just a few people. Uh, we grew to uh, half a dozen people. During that difficult time when the industry was going through transition and a lot of the photonics companies had collapsed, the telecommunications companies were in strife as well. And there was an awful lot of dark fiber around, as it was called. People had laid a huge amount of fiber, but a lot of it wasn't being used. But of course, that also was the transition through to about 2010, where people started to talk about other ways of communicating using light, in particular, moving from using pulses to using uh, amplitude and phase modulation of the pulse, which had been around for decades, but was seen at back in the 1990s was seen as a curiosity which got you papers published but which would never be commercialized particularly starting i guess with nortel that was shown to be something that could be commercialized and about that time we had a uh, the opportunity to employ somebody who had worked at nortel and understood this technology so southern photonics then moved to making test and measurement equipment for the new technologies of phase and amplitude modulation of light this is extremely expensive test and measurement equipment made by only one or two companies. And that in itself is a challenge because you are up against the big companies with very deep pockets for research and development budgets. However, this was successful. We had a a partnership with uh, some of the big companies. In fact, we moved our partners around and it became apparent that Southern Photonics should be Um, more specialized. The potential partners that we were dealing with liked what we were doing, but they asked questions like, why are you making gas sensors for the agricultural sector? Because Southern Photonics was doing lots of other things as well. So we split the company into two. The other company, the main part of the company became the test and measurement for phase and amplitude measuring equipment. That was called Coherent Solutions. That company has recently has grown and is in the process of growing further. It's uh, now been rebranded as Quantify and is uh, doing very well. Southern Photonics retained all of the other photonics things we were doing, notably sensing technologies and making um, optical fiber lasers 
And I stayed with Southern Photonics because Southern Photonics is the part which is most closely associated with the university and retained an interest and remained associated with the university in trying to bring new technologies into the marketplace. So you talk about this sort of being born out of necessity, um, but that doesn't mean that some of these technologies, some of these applications don't make you tick more than others. You know, in the first, I suppose, 15, 20 minutes of this interview, we've talked about certainly lasers and, and optics. We've also talked about biophotonics, now test and measurement. Um, maybe metrology isn't the right word to use there, but you know, the sensors, detectors, lots of different applications and technologies. As you've made this journey, in optics and photonics, what are the, some of the, the applications and technologies that you've found really have, have made you tick? For me, the technologies which I'm most keen to develop now are those which involve sensing. And partly, of course, we're all aware of climate change and the potential uh, impact of that. And I've become associated recently with the uh, photonics advocacy initiative set up by OSA, which is keen to expand a global measuring and monitoring network for the environment. The more you look into monitoring the environment, the more it becomes apparent that photonics has a huge role to play here. There are, of course, many different technologies which can be used for sensing chemicals, for sensing gases, for sensing um, temperature pressure, everything that might be important in the local environment, but the most reliable technologies and the ones which don't need to be recalibrated all the time are generally photonic. And that's where most of my energy is going and that's where most of the work in Southern Photonics is now applied. As I mentioned, there are a whole heap of technologies. The thing is that photonics, of course, is such a pervasive technology that most people in the, in the world are just not aware of all of its applications and all of the ways in which it impacts their lives, even though they don't know it. So you retain this this affiliation and, and role with academia, with the uh, university. How do we spread that message that you just mentioned? You know, what, what, what can be done to, I suppose it's not only advocacy, but much of it is. How do we, we plant that, that notion that these are core technologies and they're core technologies for a reason? Well, I'm also associated with a, a center of research excellence in New Zealand, the Dodd Wall Centre for Photonic and Quantum Technologies. And we have not just industry outreach, which I'm involved with, but also an educational outreach program. And that, that is the way I think basically you get to the young kids who have endless curiosity and just show them some of the things which are enabled by light. And the great thing about light, of course, is particularly this visible light, is that it's engaging because you can see it. The other way, of course, particularly with the younger people these days, is to just pull out your cell phone because their whole lives revolve around their cell phones. And the amount of uh, photonic technology which you can point to in there is remarkable. So that's that's another way of of getting their attention, I guess. You mentioned a survey earlier, and it it is one survey, but there are multiple iterations of it. I'll have you explain it here. But, um, you know, in the kickoff to the epic 24-hour world photonics tour, uh, that's where I was alerted to this survey. You brought it to to our attention, the public's attention. And at that point, it was a yet-released survey um, of the state of photonics in New Zealand and Australia. That was released in July 2020. And I'll stop there. What am I talking about? What's that survey, and what is it aimed to do? Okay, so this, again, was motivated by the fact that we want to bring the importance of photonics to the attention of the people who make economic decisions. In other words, not just people in industry, but people in government. So in order to do that, you need to have a report that you can point to rather than, and and preferably one which is published, which is printed, which is not just downloadable, but you can leave it on a coffee table in key places, as it were. But still, it was a fascinating exercise because it's modelled on a similar similar exercises which have been organised by SPIE in, in the US, by EPIC in, in Europe, and by individual governments in the European Union. We collaborated with John Lincoln, who produced the UK Photonics Report, which is called the hidden engine of the UK economy. And at the end of developing that survey, the Department of Trade and Industry in the UK, with whom he was talking, said, oh, 
oh, maybe photonics is as big as the pharmaceutical industry. We had no idea. <laughs> so so it's, it's that sort of eye-opening revelation that you want to get through to key people. Actually, when we embarked upon it in New Zealand and Australia, we did have a, a, a bit of a niggle in the back of our mind that we might come up with the, because it was being done by an independent organisation, we got John Lincoln to come out and do it. We did have this slight worry that what if we find out that the photonics impact in New Zealand is tiny? That would be unfortunate, right? But in fact, that wasn't what happened. We, we were, it was Simon Poole did, ran the Australian side of it, I ran the New Zealand side of it, and we identified more company. If we if we'd been asked to guess how many companies in Australia and New Zealand were reliant on photonics or use photonics in their manufacturing, we would have come up with a number about half what were uncovered in this survey. And the other really interesting about thing about the survey was that the Australian New Zealand economies are very similar in terms of the number of companies, the turnover of these companies, and what you might call the size of the photonics industry. The interesting thing about that is, is that it's, it's done on what's called an apportioned basis. In other words, if a company has a turnover of a billion dollars and only 10% of what they produce can be considered to be totally dependent upon photonics or have a component which is photonic, which has to be made as part of the whole product, then that contribution to the economy is just a hundred million, not a billion or similarly. So it's all, it's all apportioned. And that's the hard part. In New Zealand, for example, New Zealand's largest high tech company, Fish and Plague Healthcare, makes healthcare products largely for the US and the European market. Their production has skyrocketed, unfortunately, as an unfortunate side effect of COVID because they make respiratory humidifiers. Uh, which are used in intubation systems, they use photonics to measure the uh, humidity of the air. When you actually look at their company, only 1% of their production contributes to this photonics survey. Nevertheless, they're a big company, so 1% is important. So we, the other thing I just mentioned before we uh, move on from that is that the two countries have the same number of companies per head of population. And similarly, their turnover in the photonics output, which is about a billion dollars in New Zealand and five billion dollars in Australia, is proportional to their population. Dr. John Harvey is our guest. A couple more before we let you go. Uh, you talked about government in photonics and I suspect other fields and industries. There is this multi-pronged um, angle here. It's academia, it's industry. I mean, anytime those two come together, government will be there for better or for worse. It's difficult, though, to speak with government, to pitch, to advocate. What's the best way to do it? You know, what have you found is the best way to relate or, or stress the importance of some of these technologies, applications? I think we're still struggling, but what we thought was a big step forward about 10 years ago was when we discovered the word photonics in a government document. I think prior to that, you would have never seen that word. In, uh, and so we had worked very hard to explain to Minister of Science, to the Department of Trade and Industry and so on, of the importance of photonics. And that's one of the values and one of the motivations for doing this survey. If enough people see it, they will start to think, oh, this is something we should be paying attention to. Auckland Laser Lab, uh, Southern Photonics, that was 2001. In a life of photonics, have you, have you been able to step back and see the industry, the field grow? Well, yes, it's been um, very interesting in that there have been other people who have taken photonics industry forward in New Zealand. I'll mention in particular Professor Kather Simpson, who was also at the University of Auckland, who has set up two companies using photonic technologies, which, which have become very successful. And interestingly, both of those companies have taken advantage of New Zealand's preeminent position in the world in terms of agricultural exports, in particular dairy exports. So it, I mentioned before, this is our biggest export. What she did was to go and talk at length to people in this industry to ask what their problems were. If, if they come up with a serious problem that hasn't yet been resolved, then you go away and think, how can photonics help? And so the two systems that she has come up with, which uh, have been commercialized successfully, one of them deals with the problem we have in New Zealand, that we have a big dairy industry, which means that you have to produce replacement cows, but when you produce replacement cows, 
by normal reproduction, half of the offspring are male. And these are basically of no value. So they are discarded in a nice way. <laughs> and that, of course, is unfortunate. It's not only wasteful, it's, um, it, it's not something you'd like to avoid. So the, the farmer, what the farmers wanted was for all the offspring to be female. And the uh, company which Kate has set up uh, uses photonic technology to sort spermatozoa because nearly all of insemination in New Zealand in the dairy industry is artificial. So you can ensure that the offspring are females. And that has had a huge economic impact. But it turns out not only in New Zealand, but it's also, of course, great interest to companies overseas. So that company has now received substantial investment and has partially moved overseas. Another one which uh, she set up was to monitor milk as the milk is produced in a milking machine. So really, it's interesting that photonics can be applied to just about anything. The question is, go and talk to the players in industry, find out what their problems are, and then go away and see how, how we can use photonics to solve it, rather than, of course, just doing research in the lab for its own sake. I never thought I'd be asking a uh, podcast guest here and all things photonics. Uh, what's your problem? Um, but I'm going to ask you that now since you've posited and, and set me up so well for that. Final question here. What are some of the problems um, that optics and photonics are apt to, to help resolve, if not fully resolve? Well, I think uh, we're all aware, of course, of the situation in the current pandemic, which requires extensive testing. And I don't know how many people realize that nearly all testing for COVID is done using photonic technologies. One of the issues, which again, Professor Simpson's group has been looking at, is how can you do this more quickly? If you, if you have a test, then you don't necessarily, it would be very good if you didn't have to wait 24 to 48 hours for a return. So high-speed testing is one of the things which can be done. Uh, the question is one of reliability. So that's the first thing that springs to mind that photonic technologies can provide solutions to. But one of the key things that I've found in talking to industry in this role of moving between industry and university is that you have to talk to industry for long enough to understand what their problems are. Often they're not articulating these problems as problems because they, they don't think there's a solution but you just have to understand what the bottlenecks are in different industries and then see how photonics can contribute. Dr. John Harvey is the founder of the University of Auckland Laser Lab, founder of Southern Photonics, OSA's International Photonics Advocacy Coalition, uh, and for our purposes, the voice of photonics in New Zealand. John, thank you for being on with us. Thank you very much, Jake. Nice talking to you. We'll pivot now to the world of biophotonics and to the University of Illinois Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology, a confluence of big data, microscopy, optical biosensing, and microfabrication flavor the research pursuits of our next guest, though today we'll be looking at an area of research that incorporates a whole slew of other buzzwords. And we're talking spectroscopy, optical measurements, chirality, quantum cascade lasers, and discrete frequency infrared microscopy, so the whole spread. To discuss that work with us is the founder professor in bioengineering and a repeat figure in photonics media's news coverage over the years, Dr. Rohit Bahargava. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jake. Nice to be here with you. So we'll talk about this one particularly fascinating line, area of research. Your group published a paper in analytical chemistry in December, and I'm going to do my best to summarize it uh, with some brevity here. To summarize the outcome, the work outlines a path that speeds up the image acquisition time and improves the signal-to-noise ratio of what is known as vibrational circular dichroism, VCD. Uh, and it does this in a way that allows your team to use VCD to image solid tissue. Uh, we'll get into the specifics of that. There's a lot to unpack. Um, we'll get into the measurement technique that you have charted in a moment. But I want first for you to define for our listeners VCD. Thank you, Jake. So VCD stands for vibrational circular dichroism. Uh, and essentially, it's the difference in absorption between right and left-handed polarized light, uh, circularly polarized light, by a given specimen. Uh, the interesting part about VCD, uh, which is the analog for the electrical circular dichroism, which measures electronic states, is we actually measure molecular vibrational modes. So not only can you get information about the molecule and composition, but you can also get very specific submolecular molecular 
uh, information, uh, organization, confirmation, et cetera, from this technique. So the new work effectively boosts VCD. Uh, more to it than that, but it boosts VCD, and it relies on infrared spectroscopic imaging to get there. Uh, the method isn't the outcome of the research, although it's certainly a component of it. Can you describe the spectroscopy method in the work for us. Yeah, thanks. So VCD, our work here that we reported actually builds on decades of work in VCD and decades of work in IR microscopy. So VCD as a technique is uh, quite uh, well used. Uh, there are commercial manufacturers who make VCD instruments. Uh, most of those instruments, though, are for bulk measurements. Uh, it's very hard to make microscopic VCD measurements because it's a really small effect. So when you take light and put it through a microscope, uh, perhaps restrict it to a small spatial region, and then try to measure it, uh, either it takes far too long or you just don't have enough signal to make reliable measurements. Uh, conversely, the same problem existed in IR microscopy. So over many years, uh, now almost two decades, uh, my lab and I have invested our efforts in making better microscopy measurements. Now we're at a point where we can make really sensitive microscopy measurements so we thought we should try this idea of trying to do VCD in a microscopy format, uh, which has been uh, you know, an idea that's been around for some time, but only now it's become practical. So key to this latest work is, is the instrumentational component, uh, and it's a spectroscopic microscope. So you're really combining two into one uh, in, in many ways. It can, can form, perform excuse me, the technique that you've just described. Um, but what's so intriguing about the device is that it's a QCL, a quantum cascade laser. And not a thermal light source. That would be the alternative that serves as the framework. And I'm curious, was the, the motivation, the, the impetus for the work really to, to incorporate a quantum cascade laser and see what potential could uh, be delivered? Yeah, that's uh, partly true. So the, the main problem with making VCD measurements in a microscope with a thermal source was that we normally used a really broadband sort of low intensity thermal source because the Fourier transform method that was normally used to, to measure IR spectra is so efficient. And actually a thermal source really is the only option or was the only option that offered you this broad bandwidth uh, you know, of light. And uh, because the FDR process is so efficient and thermal sources that are high intensity not readily available, you know, microscopy also relied in those, uh, those two things and sort of made the compromise that you know, we will uh, start to initially acquire images that are not particularly high signal to noise ratio. So the advent of the quantum cascade laser actually changed that in two ways. Uh, one, it allowed us to make measurements frequency by frequency, which meant uh, we could focus all our efforts onto a particular vibrational mode uh, and use our light budget, for example, very efficiently to measure that. The quantum cascade laser is just an absolutely amazing source, uh, offering orders of magnitude higher intensity compared to a thermal source, of course. Uh, so those are two advantages, but with a thermal source, you know, the, the problem also is that when we take a thermal source and we use apertures to restrict it so that we can actually get the spectral resolution in an FDIR measurement, we then have to use a second uh, set of restrictive apertures or uh, some sort of pixel-based detection to actually do microscopy. And by the time you restrict and distribute light in this manner, there really isn't a lot of signal left to make really weak uh, effects observable in a traditional thermal source equipped FDIR microscope. So, uh, you know, it is difficult to, to get high spatial resolution, high spectral resolution, and good VCD data. And consequently, that had never been achieved in a thermally equipped FDR microscope. So VCD uh, is really possible now with a QCL microscope as a primary, uh, you know, driver. There are some other advantages, but I'll stop here with, uh, you know, sort of the big advantages there. Yeah, so I mean, you've, you've tackled VCD. The data is really clean. It's good, useful data. But, but I do want to ask you, what other extensions might this method or near variations of it be able to support in the future? What, uh, what could come next? Yeah, there's actually a lot of work remaining still to make VCD reliable and to understand the various uh, factors that might contribute to a recorded VCD signal. So indeed, we've put the system together and made the initial measurements, but just like we did many years ago, just simply getting microscopy data from, you know, in the spectroscopic domain is not the end of it. So we spent several years, just a few years ago, uh, to develop new theory that accounted for how light is propagated, scattered, absorbed, et cetera, that forms the, the total signal in an image in IR microscopy. And, you know, several surprises emerged from that. The idea, for example, of high definition IR imaging uh, was something that was totally unexpected. So now what we are embarking on is to try and understand 
how VCD signals are recorded in an IR microscope, what the various factors are that might contribute to, say, uh, an increase in signal or, or less noise or somehow understand the artifacts that might result in it. But by systematically modeling this, we hope that we will, first of all, make better measurements. Second, I think we uh, now will next tackle dynamic uh, changes in samples that lead to evolutions of VCD. So what's next is perhaps looking at changes in confirmation or aggregation uh, or even synthesis within uh, systems within dynamic systems so we can measure VCD as a function of time. Uh, and of course, there's the whole issue of understanding chirality uh, as it relates to organization and biological materials uh, is now wide open. So we're, uh, you know, we're hoping we'll use this instrument for that. Uh, and you, you know, you join us from the, um, the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology. A lot of work going on, not just in your lab, your group, but uh, the center as a whole. And I'll put you on the spot. What are we seeing happen at the uh, at the institute now? Uh, what research areas are horizontal, and where is some of the work going? Oh, this is really an amazing and exciting time here in the Beckman, and and broadly for the field of photonics and biophotonics. So obviously, there are a number of really excellent research groups uh, hosted within the Beckman Institute. And several of my colleagues and I are focused on advancing biophotonics. But we're doing so in a, in a really interesting, coordinated manner. Uh, so first, one trend is that we formed a new cancer center on our campus. This is a technology-focused cancer center. And imaging, uh, particularly optical imaging, is a huge component in that center. So there are several of us who are trying to take uh, optical techniques and bring them to point of care, for example. There are others who are trying to understand molecularly uh, the composition of cells and tissues that are important in disease progression. There are yet others who are using light to control biological systems and uh, understand their behavior from that perspective. So one trend I see is this disease focus uh, that our cancer center enables. Interestingly, we are a cancer center that is focused on technology development and moving it to use rather than patient care. So we are a basic science cancer center, basic science focused cancer center, and our particular expertise will be technology. Uh, the second major trend I see is this convergence of both uh, fabrication capability, for example, now on-demand 3D manufacturing capability, and the new capabilities in artificial intelligence. So that is a really developing area, and we're, we're quite focused on that. The third place where I would say is, that is exciting in the Beckman Institute is a molecular focus with our optical imaging techniques. So how do we probe, manipulate, and control molecular activity in complex systems using light uh, is an emerging focus area. So really ex exciting times and lots of great people around here. So it's a fun place to be. Rohit Bhargav has been our guest. Thank you so much for being on. I hope we can catch up again soon. Lots of great work happening in your group and others. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Jake. Appreciate it. That does it for this episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to Joel Williams with the news. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthings at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website. Subscribe, never miss an episode. I'm Jake Saltzman. This has been a Photonics Media Production.